I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good afternoon. It is 3.41 p.m. Tuesday, March 30th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I hope you're ready in our guest segment for a five-minute unsolicited question on the New York Rangers. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And after all this time, I still don't have a title. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I'm just hoping to get out of the penalty box in this uh, event. <laughs> The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Designed with flexibility in mind, the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale is back. The excitement of Derby Week, a new integrated format featuring an enhanced all-digital catalog, the option to sell horses on-site in the Keeneland sales ring or from their off-site location with live and remote bidding from buyers around the world. The April Horses of Racing Age sale is Monday, April 26th. Entries close April 5th, also this Friday. Keeneland Spring Meet opens. Now, I don't know if I've been looking forward more to a meet uh, in the past year than I have that one. Maybe Sarah Sarah Token. We're going to talk about it in our weekend preview, but that's also something to look forward to in addition to the Keeneland April sale. So last weekend, we had the Gulfstream Florida Derby card, the the extravaganza with all the stakes, and then we had the Dubai World Cup card as well. Those two were going on. Um, I other than Mystic Guide, honestly, it's hard for me to grab onto anybody from those from from the weekend's races and say, "Wow, that was a spectacular performance." Maybe you want to say Mishrif winning the Shima Classic, just because it's you know it's it's an interesting thing to win both of those races on dirt and turf back to back, and who knows what other accomplishments he has left in the year. But it was like a kind of a grinded out life and death kind of win. It wasn't a brilliant win, so it didn't really do it for me. And and in in America, I mean, No Agenda looked very good physically and visually i gotta say he also got a perfect trip he could not have gotten a better trip that inside out pocketed trip under i ride he only got a 94 buyer he was a little sloppy with his, his lead switching uh but the fact that soup and sandwich stuck around for a second was not was kind of an indictment of that field and i think the main takeaway from the florida derby i think the winner is is nice and will be you know a reasonable contender in the kentucky derby but what do you do with greatest honor because i've said this all along that he's obviously got a lot of talent, but his running style is such that he's going to get in trouble. He's going to get dirty and he's going to have a tough time running down, you know, a double digit amount of horses in the Derby. And it, you know, it does happen once in a while. You do get a deep closer to win the Derby, but in general, it's better to have tactical speed. And he just has none of that. You know, I, I saw Jose Ortiz trying to get after him a little bit early in the race on Saturday. And he just, he's just a plotter early. And, could not do better than a distant third in that race. I don't know. I, I, it, it sucks for me because I wanted to bet against life is good. That was my big derby opinion was that life is good is a bad bet. Now that he's gone, like, what am I going to do? Bet against greatest honor at nine to two. Like that's not nearly as exciting, but I just think, you know, he's going to be over bet because of reputation in the derby. And I just, I haven't, I haven't seen enough to take him at a relatively short price. I mean, what else, what else from the weekend did you, were you really excited about? I, I'll give you one. Um, on Sunday, they had the Florida cup card at Tampa and tap it to win came back in the Naira bets sprint. And he also got a very good trip. He was in, he was saved ground. He was inside. He got, got through with the rail, but he really kicked on once he got clear, he got 95 buyer. And he's a very interesting horse. I think this year going one turn, if you remember, he did, he, he blew away mystic guy last year in a, in a Belmont allowance that got him a ticket to the Belmont stakes didn't run as well there, but then he was second in the H Allen Jerkins and third in the Pat day mile. So he's an interesting horse going forward, but the weekend was just about mystic guy. Honestly, like he was, I thought he was an overlay at eight to five. I thought he'd be closer to six to five, even money. Cause there just wasn't any top class dirt form in that field. Unless you were in love with Jesus, his team for running second in, in the Pegasus and, you know, he was always traveling well. Luis Saez did a good job keeping him out of trouble. And it was really lights out by mid-stretch. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how much time he gets before he comes back and starts running in America again. And I would think a race like the Whitney would probably be one of their mid-season goals. But uh, I, I would guess that after running this race, 
relatively soon, people look to Bill, relatively soon after running in the Razorback, I'm guessing they're going to give him at least two, three months off. Let's hear some impressions from you guys on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, the poor thing's actually run twice this year. I mean, we'll give him off till the Breeders' Cup. I mean, you know, no, don't get me started on this stuff. Um, the, I thought the real story, and you, you mentioned Joe, was greatest honor, and even more so than known agenda, because, you know, what do you do with him now? It's always interesting how horse players can look at the same set of circumstances and come up with two completely different opinions. Saw T.D. Thornton, who does a terrific job, and I have all the respect for him in the world, had him at number one in his derby poll that came out in the TDN the other day. I'm like, how can you do this? I, I realized, you know, maybe he just had an off day, or maybe Shug didn't train him to really peak in the Florida Derby. He wants that to happen in the Kentucky Derby. I agree with you about the running style, Joe, but I'd be more concerned if I was in his camp. He was just dull. And, you know, I don't think that's the way you want to go into the Kentucky Derby off a race where you took a step backwards. Now, can he win? Of course he can. But, uh, you know, I think he went from an obvious second or third choice in the Derby to, you know, an eight to one shot or something like that. So, you know, I don't think it was a good day for him. Um, and, you know, known agenda. I, I still can't get over the fact that he got drummed into Sam F. Davis. You know, how much has he improved since then? I'm beginning to think that maybe the Florida three-year-olds were just really not very strong this year. We'll find out. I still think the strength, even without life is good, is in California. We'll, of course, find that out in the San Diego Derby this weekend. But um, I have to get a thumbs down to greatest honor. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it through a different lens. And I'm going to look at it as that, that Shug McGahee, you know, obviously has been down this path before. He knows how to train a horse for the top races. And it's okay for a horse to have a bad race. And, and still be a, a top contender. Um, he still improved based on the metrics. His buyer number is still going to be, you know, on the improve from the, the back-to-back 89s he ran last time. And he really didn't, you know, have it his own way um, and, and, and showed it. And he just, he was kind of flat. Um, but that being said, he ran third. I don't think that, that uh, Jose Ortiz did him any favors by pinning him to the rail and having him, you know, try to go around the racetrack um, up the rail the whole time. I know that that's not the way the horse likes to run. If you watch his, you know, his big sweeping moves are always on the outside. Um, so I'm not necessarily convinced that that was the right decision to make. Um, am I going to go ahead and bet hand over fist on unknown agenda based on, you know, back to back wins, um, you know, one being an allowance race and in this race, probably not. Um, but he certainly, I think Irad did a great job, you know, managing him the right way and, and riding him. Um, interestingly enough, I also think that, um, you know, that, that, that Tyler Gaffleon got outridden um, out of the gate. You know, he really tried to make sure that his horse was going to the front and they, they parked him five wide and that made him have to make a decision to try to get collaborate up front or, or back. And, you know, I think that pretty much, uh, you know, tank collaborate, you know, from, from hitting the board in that race. Um, so, you know, overall, I think it was a lackluster race. We've been saying for weeks that Florida was not the hotbed, the springboard for top three-year-olds coming into the Kentucky Derby. And I think this kind of proved it again. Um, one takeaway that, that I had on this race that I thought was unique, uh, you know, for, for racing these days, how about the top five finishers in the Florida Derby, all homebreds? None of them saw an auction, uh, you know, an auction site um, as a weanling, yearling or, or even two year old. I think that's pretty unusual um, because so many people are now breeding to for the commercial aspect of it and not to race. And yet you had known agenda was a homebred and soup and sandwich is a homebred. Greatest honor, uh, Nova Rags and collaborate. So to me, that was that was just kind of an interesting tidbit in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I thought that we haven't touched on the, the oaks at all. And I thought that Crazy Beautiful ran a really good race, um, you know, off off the Oaks. Was it a stellar field? No, but I'm curious to see how she's going to, you know, do in the uh, in the Kentucky Oaks um, against Ali Dar and Affirmed. I mean, whoever Bill was talking about, you know, you know, about the two Phillies last week. Um, well, swaps and Nashua. Swaps and OK, well, I'll believe that. Yeah. Ali Dar and Affirmed was a little too much. OK, uh, but I thought that she was rounding in the form again, an 83 buyer and not not blown anybody away. But I think that Kenny McPeak has shown time and time again that he can get a Philly ready for, you know, for the big races and and that's what she's kind of leaning into um my only other takeaway from from this weekend's racing and we didn't touch on the jeff ruby stakes uh you know which is a, a you know a graded stake race over at turfway it's it's a hundred point race just like all the other races we've been talking about and the big races that are coming up this weekend it is a hundred pointer 
how in the hell is this a hundred point um, race for the Kentucky Derby? Other than the fact that, oh, by the way, you know, Churchill Downs probably has an influence because I think they still own Turfway Park. But how is, you know, this race on the all weather track, a hundred pointer when, you know, there's other races earlier in the season that are much, much more important on the dirt, but our 50 pointers or, or 30 pointers or, you know, or, or 10 pointers. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that that race in particular, the Jeff Ruby stake, or the, it used to be the old spiral, why that's a hundred pointer at this stage of the game. I mean, you answered the question that Churchill has an investment in Turfway and they, they want to pump up that race, but yeah, it's a completely irrelevant race on the Derby trail. It's a joke that it's a hundred points when a race like the Southwest is 10 points. 10 points to the winner of the, of, of the Southwest, which is, has a $750,000 purse and every year draws top level three-year-olds. Uh, it's just one of those things that I think over time, it, it needs a little tweaking. I think the, the point system is good overall and adds to the intrigue of getting to the Derby. But yeah, over time, it's going to need some tweaking, kind of like the the graded stakes ratings that you know seem pretty arbitrary sometimes. Just for crazy, crazy beautiful. She ran well, had a pretty good trip. I don't know. It's just overall, I can't shake the the idea that this is a very subpar group of three year old fillies. And until I see somebody prove me wrong, I'm I'm gonna you know go with that and you know maybe hit the all button in the oaks because there's nobody other other than maybe travel column. I just feel like there's nobody you can really latch onto as, as a top class three-year-old Philly. Maybe this is a discussion better save for another day when we have more time, but there's a story and T.D. Thornton um, touched on this in his Week in Review. All these horses, Known Agenda, Mystic Guide, they're all winning off of laces. What happened to the sky is falling, doom and gloom, this is going to be the worst thing that ever happened to horse racing when these horses have to run without laces? What has happened? Nothing. I mean, at this point, I don't think you even notice it or pay any attention to it. I haven't seen any horse that ran it, like dreadful race that they came back and said that we needed Lasix or something like that. And I haven't seen in any, you know, major form reversals. And, you know, it's something worth noticing and, and worth talking about as we're going further and further away from this mentality of, of giving this medication or drug to these horses. But, you know, every single week, the same things happens. These horses, their form holds up. The Lasix seems to be not any part of the story whatsoever. I feel like there's not enough data and not enough of a sample size yet to say whether or not it has an effect. I mean, I agree with you that overall Lasix is is overhyped in general. Both pro and anti Lasix people need to chill the hell out. Like, I don't think it, it's it's that big of a deal one way or another for horses. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't expect there to be a monster difference from races that are run with Lasix and run without. I think you know you'll get the the odd horse that's not going to run his race because they, they, they bled, but you know, I've been kind of ambivalent about it, you know, one way or any other, most of this time. And I, I still feel that way. If they want to get rid of Lasix, fine. If they don't like, I'm, I'm not going to cry about it, but, but John's a horse owner. So maybe he has a stronger opinion. Yeah. I think you're going to see more and more um, if there is any evidence of, of horses not handling, you know, running without the, the benefit of Lasix, you're going to see it um, during the, the dog days of summer when it's more humid, it doesn't get cool at night or in the morning and horses that um, have a, a, you know, a, a, a predetermination of, of bleeding, that's when it's going to come out is when it's hot and humid and, and they're not able to, to kind of bounce back after these races. But I think the trainers have learned, um, you know, what are the things they can do, whether it's other drugs or other other techniques to try to make it so horses um, can run, you know, without Lasix. Uh, but, you know, I think, Bill, it, it is a conversation for, for another day because we can even throw in the fact that is the industry, you know, is this like a red herring? No pun intended. I mean, why why is everyone so concerned about Lasix when you have these trainers and, and vets that are using illegal drugs that, that you know, 27 of them got indicted for it? Um, and and we can't even, you know, we're arguing over Lasix? I mean, yeah. to me, it, it's kind of like it's a moot point. Let's let's go after the real stuff. Um, and, and, you know, Bill, to your point, if horses are running well without Lasix, um, then that's great. That's only going to make it better for the entire industry. I think you're seeing some of the older horses be managed differently because they're, they are used to being on Lasix for such a long time. Um, but these three-year-olds so far haven't really had any kind of a negative impact. You're right. Um, w without the, uh, the uh, benefit of, of Lasix. Yeah. I think the, the, the consensus for now should be that it's going to affect a small percentage of horses, but overall it's not going to greatly affect the racing product. I don't think, but we'll see. 
Before we move on from the weekend's races, we got to talk about this uh, on Saturday on the Dubai World Cup card. Um, the, the Golden Shaheen, which is the, the biggest sprint in that part of the world. Uh, it's a $1.5 million Group 1 race. It's been won by a lot of great horses o- over the years. Uh, a horse named Zenden ran off with a three and a half length win at 57 to one and then promptly broke down and died afterwards. I don't know if he broke down, but he, he, he collapsed and died after the race. Um, and this was, this, this caused a lot of, you know, real suspicion in, in the sport because of who the horse's trainer is. Now, if you're not familiar, Carlos David is the trainer of Zenden and he is a former assistant to Jason service, the now indicted Jason service. Um, and he's a guy that if you follow Florida racing, he wins at 23, 24, 25%. I think he's a little less than that this year. I think he's with like 80 starters. He's like 19% or something. But last year he was 23% and he moves horses up off the claim. You know, if you look at his, his first off the claim numbers, they're not quite what Jason services were, but they're in the ballpark. And to me, that's where this, the suspicion first off comes from is when you can move up horses regularly, including very cheap horses. Now, Zenden was not a move up. He's a horse that, that's been in that barn for a little bit. But let's just take a look at the for the last couple of starts before the Golden Sheen that Zenden ran. The last graded stakes he ran in was the Mr. Prospector on December 19th at Gulfstream. He was 12th, beaten 16 lengths. Uh, then he lost an allowance optional claimer at Tampa. Then he ran in the Pelican stakes at Tampa and was life and death to be a superstar by the name of Super Stonehenge. Um, so that was the form that Zenden had going into the, the, the golden Shaheen. And you never know, like sometimes horses for just whatever reason are doing great. And like, you know, the, the trainer can sense it and you know, let's, let's be aggressive and spot them. You know, they're going to be a million to one, you know, let's, let's take a shot. And then sometimes those horses win, but the surrounding evidence around all of this while you cannot make accusations and I have no knowledge whatsoever that Carlos David is doing anything wrong, the circumstantial evidence around this horse winning like that in one of the most prestigious sprint races in the world at 57 to one winning off and then dying right after the race. I think it's reasonable for people to have suspicions. I wonder what you guys thought, sir. Yeah, there's not a whole lot to add to that, Joe. But I think that one of the things we're dealing with here is wouldn't it be great that we don't even have to ask these kind of questions that, you know, the game would be cleaned up to the point where all three of us think, you know, 99.9999% of the time it's won by the best horse and the best trainer, the best horsemanship. And we obviously aren't dealing with that. And it, that was the case well before Jorge Navarro and Jason Service came around. And it's probably going to be the case for, for a while to come. And, you know, again, people know where I stand on this, but, you know, the people that want to get rid of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, uh, you know, like the South Dakota HBPA and those kind of guys, you know, come on. Don't you see what's going on out there? Don't you see the need to clean this sport up? And it's bigger than whether or not you can use Lasix or just like you said, Joe, or, or, you know, if it's unconstitutional. It's about taking a sport that is really on the precipice of totally bombing out with the American public for a lot of reasons. Being able to say to the American public, we got it, we fixed it, we cleaned it up. And again, let's hope we're doing this show five years from now. And the next time a horse wins at 57 to 1 in the Dubai Golden Sheen off crappy form, we don't have any suspicions whatsoever. Yeah, and, and the guy has a right to, to try to make a living. I mean, you know, just because he was Jason Service's assistant doesn't necessarily mean he was doing the same thing that Jason Service was doing. Um, but Joe, to your point, absolutely one of the indicators of you know, of, of a trainer that, that you have a question about is what have they done when they've inherited horses from other other barns, whether it's claiming horses or just owners shifting horses, you know, to that new trainer. And, and I saw on the internet that, that one of the claims that was out there was that, um, uh, Carlos David's first start off of a new trainer. So whether it was claimed or a horse that that he inherited, he was nine for 31. That's almost a 30% win percentage. That's maybe he's just much, much better. And, and if he is, then you tip your hat to him. But that that's that's a questionable stat. You got to wonder about stuff like that. And it leaves it leaves such a sour taste in your mouth. Like, you know, I've I've gotten, you know, as as someone who plays Gulfstream, like I've gotten beaten by 
Carlos David horses off the claim that made no sense on paper. And then they win. And sometimes they win big. And, you know, you're all, there's so many conclusions that you can draw from that in your mind, whether or not you have proof, which we don't, whether or not you're, you know, have ground to stand on to make accusations, which we don't necessarily have concrete, you know, ground here, but you don't want tragedies that are fed by, I think, reasonable suspicions about certain trainers. So we'll, we'll keep working for that. And it's just, we haven't made it there yet. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. So now that we've gotten past the bad news of the of the weekend and the work still left to do, it's time to celebrate just a tiny little bit some good news. Yesterday, John's celebrating too much, but that's how he does. Um, I don't know. He's waving his hands in the air like he just doesn't care. I'm dancing, um, but, dancing to the uh, to what was your what was your favorite uh, artist, Bill? The weekend. The weekend. The weekend. I was dancing. Yeah. To the weekend. I have all his LPs. We should have like a weekend sponsored segment, like the weekend recap sponsored by the weekend. Well, the weekend. Um, right. Anyway. So as we digress, uh, <laughs> yesterday there was news that came out um, that the equine injury database, which is a, a relatively new thing, it's, they've only been tracking injuries, uh, fatal injuries since 2009, uh, it reported the lowest number of fatalities per 1,000 starters since they started tracking the data in North American racetracks in 2020. So um, the number of fatal injuries declined by 7.8% from 2019. Uh, to 1.41% per 1,000 starters. And the overall decrease since 2009, when they first started tracking, and the rate was two per 1,000 starters, has dropped 29.5% overall. So this has got, over time, this is pretty big movement. There's obviously still a lot of work to do. Uh, it was, the, one of the notable things too was in California, how well California did last year. Santa Anita which had a breakdown rate of 3.01 in that disastrous 2019 year, had a rate of just 1.17 last year. And Del Mar, I believe, they, did they not have a single They had one, one they break had one. two mates. Right. Yeah. So they had, I mean, that's that's an incredible statistic as well. I think Delmar has kind of always been at the forefront of the safety thing. And, and just a few more stats I wanted to mention before I toss it to Bill. Uh, synthetic tracks as usual, were the safest. Their fatality rate was 1.02. Uh, turf was 1.27 and dirt was 1.49. Um, and sprint races are, are more dangerous than route races. I think we've, we've learned that over time. Uh, the fatality rate for races run at more than a mile was 1.22, 1.35 for races run between six and eight furlongs and 1.66 for races shorter than six furlongs. I don't know that that necessarily means that sprint racing is inherently more dangerous. I think it probably is a little bit, but I think a lot of that too is so many cheap horses running at those distances that I think that that affects it a lot as well. So I don't know if it's necessarily an apples to apples comparison to, to, to you know, compare route races to sprint races. Anyway, those are the, those are the takeaway statistics. Obviously big news in our corner of the world. Uh, I'll toss it over to Bill. Yeah, I mean, this really was good news, Joe, and it's good news for the present because that number has gotten down to something that, you know, still too high. We understand that, but you can point to this and tell racing's critics, we are doing a better job. We are working towards even uh, smaller numbers than this. And I think that's one of the things, too, that um, the you go from the 2.0 in 2009 to the 1.41 in 2020. Can we get it to below one? I think this thing, those are, are, you know, everybody says the same thing in the right. It's never going to be zero and we're going to have to live with that. And unfortunately, I think racing's critics are going to be on its back as long as it's not zero. If it, if it, but the goal from here should be, I think, to get it down 
it won't happen overnight, but in another three, four years, you know, really get it to below one. And, you know, that's an admirable goal. We're seeing like the Stornet Group doing so much stuff uh, at Gulfstream in Santa Anita to try to get it down. You know, Del Mar, like you said, I mean, their record was fantastic. Keeneland had a very good record. So it's good news. And, you know, I, I'm not one to, to uh, jump on the other people in the media, but I do agree with people in race and say, well, where's PETA now? Where are the, the idiots that ran onto the track at Golden Gate Fields? Why aren't they out there congratulating racing for doing a better job? Um, the news media in California, which you gave wall-to-wall -wall coverage of these breakouts. I don't know for a fact, but I think I would have heard if the LA Times or any of the TV stations out in Los Angeles would have done a story. Hey, look what's happened in Santa Anita, how much better this was than two years ago. I think that is fair criticism that the media has been unfair to racing. But, you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, I guess in our lifetimes, it's never going to be zero. But I think we should be able to set uh, goals from here to so that this number keeps going down, 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 down as low as possible. No, these are great numbers. These are really fantastic numbers because as an industry, we recognized that there were, the numbers were way too high, that horses were breaking down, um, you know, whether it was a $5,000 claimer on a Tuesday or in the Breeders' Cup and, and some of the big races that were nationally televised. Um, you know, it, it was something that needed to be addressed, something that needed to be recognized. And I think as an industry, we've come together to try to make things safer for horses. And, and it's it does cost money to do these things. Um, but obviously, you know, racetracks are being much more proactive with their racing surfaces, um, even with Gulfstream announcing that they're going to actually add uh, a poly surface to, you know, a third track in essence to, uh, to Gulfstream, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and you can see that the poly track actually is helping in safety and, and decreasing the amount of, uh, of, of fatalities. Um, one number that did stick out that, that you guys hadn't mentioned before I want to talk about is the fact that two-year-olds have such a higher percentage um, of fatalities, especially in comparison to older horses. Um, and even, you know, Joe, you mentioned cheaper horses, you would think would be a higher number, but actually two-year-olds have the highest, um, you know, breakdown rate, um, you know, in, in by class. And I still think that as an industry, we have to look at two-year-olds and the way that they're being um, broken and trained, especially when they go through two-year-old sales. And that is still an unregulated part of the industry and, and one that needs to be um, focused on going forward. I know that they that the major auction houses have implemented you know, certain drugs that aren't being, that aren't allowed. Um, but I don't know, honestly, what the testing process is. I know that they give you as an end user buyer, the option to spend your own money to have these horses drug tested. Um, and I think it's a very, very, very small percentage of people who actually do that. But I think that is adding to um, why these young horses have a higher breakdown percentage um, than, than the three-year-olds or the older horses, you know, by comparison. One thing I also want to add, and, and again, you know, I take it with a grain of salt because it's on the Twitter sphere, it's on, you know, social media, is that so many people came out and railed against the media saying, how come you didn't talk about this and why didn't you, you know, publicize the fact, and, and I agree that we have to, you know, also you know, trumpet and 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 champion the good numbers in this as well. But there were some people on on Twitter sphere that were saying, "Oh, well, of course the numbers were, of fatalities were down because the number of racing dates were down." How about you read the goddamn article first and see that it's a percentage, morons? Will you look at the article and not just the headline and read it and then realize, oh, it's a percentage, and that's and that's why we're all so happy about the fact that there's less fatalities, not that there were less horses running, please. Yeah, we should have a segment every week where we can like fry people who are morons on Twitter over their stupid tweets. Like that would be very satisfying for me. Um, yeah, so it's it is per one thousand starters. In case anybody out there doesn't doesn't get that, a um, couple things I do want to shout out Keeneland. Like I didn't Bill mentioned Keeneland. They were second to Del Mar. Each Del Mar and Keeneland both had one fatality the entire year in 2020. Del Mar had more starters, so their breakdown rate was was lesser. Uh, it was 0.29 at Del Mar, 0.50 at Keeneland, which is also just stellar. And that's the kind of that, those are the kind of numbers that we're looking for. And I agree with Bill. I think one is a good benchmark to set. We want to get below one per thousand starters because after that, like I I don't honestly know how much better you can do than that. Like even like the safest tracks in the world are probably about one right now, or maybe just a, a smidge below that. So that should be the goal. And I think that's a, that's a nice round 
benchmark to get to. And I think that's what everybody um, should be working towards. But to the point about, you know, how the media is, isn't, isn't reporting this and, you know, this is where it would come in handy to have a united PR arm in our industry to put out press releases, trumpeting this and championing this, like, Every other sport, like if someone's going to protest something or someone's going to call them out or something, they have a, a PR arm that represents the entire industry that can easily and quickly push back on those narratives. And racing does not have that. And unfortunately, that's not one of the things that I think Heisa is going to solve. I think that's going to be more of a drug enforcement thing. That's something that we still need in racing is like a united, powerful PR arm to, to, you know, push back against, against negative news when there is positive news. Because I remember, you know, when the, the Golden Gate protesters were out there, I just saw a lot of like, you know, kind of petulant anger at them. Like, oh, go get a job, you hippies and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you fight back with data like this that proves that the sport is getting safer over time. You know, for the people that you know, don't think the sport should exist, don't think horses should run for money or for entertainment, you can't obviously ever appease them. But I think there are a lot of people who have reasonable criticisms that the sport is too dangerous. So this is the way you push back on that. Here's the entire database of fatal breakdowns in 2020. Here's where we are now. Here's where we were last year. Here's where we were when this first started. You can see the trajectory of breakdowns is clearly going down. So that's sort of one of the real deficits I think that racing has is that we don't have that, that united PR push to, you know, fight back against these, these negative stories. And, you know, until we have that, this is just going to be the nature of the beast is that the negative stories are going to get all the ink and the positive stories are kind of going to be buried on page a hundred. So that's something that, that I think has to change over time. It's not going to be easy. It's going to, it's going to take a really united effort and maybe hiring some fancy pants PR firms along the way to, you know, really get the word out. But overall, this is, this is good news. And even though there are still terrible things like the Zenden breakdown and, you know, we, we still have, you know, shady people in, in the business. I think overall the, the, the arrow is pointing in the right direction. And this is, this is more evidence of that. So let's keep up the good work. Shout out to everybody that's involved with keeping that database. Cause like I said, it's only been around since 2009. This was something that was sorely needed for the sport. And, you know, everybody just, just keep, keep on keeping on and, and keep uniting around the purpose of horse safety. Cause that's the one thing that I think everyone can agree on everyone in the industry, everyone outside the industry critics. I think we can all agree that we tr should try to make the sport safer for the horses. So as long as that's your North star and you keep on with that, I think we're going to see more positive news stories like this. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www. Dot greenco.com. So we are super thrilled this week. Our Green Group Guest of the Week is NHL legend, broadcasting legend, and handicapping legend, all three. Eddie Olchek, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Joe. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. We're, uh, it's great to have you, especially for me, since I'm the only one on the podcast that actually watches hockey. These other guys <laughs> will pretend like they do, but they don't. Um, I, I just watched you the other day in the Rangers-Caps game. But I'm going to start with this. We had Eric Johnson from the Colorado Avalanche on our show a little while ago. He's a horse owner. And we asked him kind of if there's ever, if he's seen any crossover between his hockey, you know, coworkers and friends and racing people. I'm wondering if you have any kind of anecdotes about that, about whether or not you've been able to, you know, convert some people from hockey or the broadcasting world to horse racing. Yeah, I think over my uh, <laughs> My hockey and horse racing career, uh, I think I've been able to uh, maybe uh, cross over on both, so to speak. Uh, 
you know, hockey people, they know my passion for the game, uh, you know, for the sport, for the equine athlete, the people that are involved in it. And I think, uh, you know, over my time since going to the racetrack, since I was uh, 13 years old here in Chicago at old Arlington Park racetrack, um, for me, it was, uh, you know, love at first sight. And I think anybody that I either bring to the racetrack or teach them about handicapping or just share stories about horse racing, once they go, it kind of seems like uh, they continue to go. So I'd like to think that I've made an impact as far as in the horse racing aspect of it. Uh, getting you know hockey people at, at least involved in it whether it's during the triple crown the breeders cup whatever it might be uh, and, and i know on the other side the horse racing aspect of it I, I think i've turned a lot of horse racing people into hockey fans which both sports uh, quite frankly could certainly use and uh, i think we could use some younger people as well um you know getting to know both games and uh, and loving both games just like i do so as i love to say joe pucks and ponies there's nothing better and uh uh, it's a, uh, it's a great time of year with the triple crown right around the corner and the NHL playoffs right around the corner. So it's, uh, it's a great time of year and it's, uh, a real pleasure to, to be able to talk about pucks and ponies. Hey Eddie, it's Bill Finley and thanks for joining us. And I would just start off with uh, your overview of this three-year-old group. I mean, we're going to find out a lot this weekend, but between, uh, today and the day you go on your broadcast of the Derby, you're going to have to know all the insides outs of these horses, yeah. come up with picks, et cetera. I personally think it's a very strong group, but I want your opinion on it. Yeah, Bill, first off, good to see you. Um, I, I thought that, uh, you know, the emergence of uh, life is good. Uh, I think he probably would have separated himself from everybody else. I think he would have been probably the big time favorite come Kentucky Derby, you know, and we know what ifs are in life and ifs, ifs in horse racing. He's out, he's off the Derby trail. So I think what that has done now is I think that has opened up uh, to where we might have a Kentucky Derby. And I, and I really, quite frankly, I don't care what happens in between now and the Kentucky Derby. I think that the favorite, in my opinion, uh, I would handicap it as the favorite in Kentucky Derby would be four to one and everybody else is going to be five, six, seven, 10, 12, whatever it is, probably make a case for five or six horses. Uh, I've been on the, I've been on the bandwagon of, uh, of greatest honor risk taking for Chad Brown, who's going to run in the woods soon. And, uh, and also known agenda, known agenda reminds me um, of Vino Rosso for whatever reason, he just reminds me of Vino Rosso. And I mean, what a win in the Florida Derby. So I, I I've been on those three horses for about, uh, five or six weeks. And I actually did a, um, I, I did a, a, a similar call to this with, uh, uh, with, uh, an insurance company. And they asked me for maybe a future Derby pick. And I said, you know what? I said, if you can get down on a horse by the name of known agenda, I said, the horse come off a bad, you know, I, you know, I would say a bad race, but a, what would you say, Bill? Just a, a mediocre run in, in the yeah, Samuel right? San Davis, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I thought, you know what? This horse to me just has too much, the breeding, the connections. Um, I just said, you know, keep an eye on known agenda. And sure enough, I got an email yesterday going, holy cow, you're, you know, the horse that you like won the, the Florida Derby. And now, from being, you know, whatever. I, I mean, I know some people that got down uh, at about 85 to one on known agenda, you know, maybe known agenda is about, you know, six or seven to one can come to Kentucky Derby. I just throwing that out there. So I think it's wide open and uh, it's going to be great for us handicappers and betters because the value is definitely going to be there. Now we still have a long time before the May 1st, the first Saturday in May bill, but I think it's absolutely going to be wide open. Yeah. And, and Eddie, you know, it's great to talk to you, uh, especially because you were a professional athlete. We've had horses with Bobby Hurley, professional basketball player, Eric Johnson, professional hockey player. And both of them have commented to us that, you know, because they're around athletes all the time, they can really see when a horse is, you know, so athletic and so fluid in their motion. Yeah. Are there times where you're handicapping a race and you look out in the paddock or, or in the pre-race warm up and you go, you know what, that horse is the kind of horse that that just, you know, resonates with me as an athlete? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be better at that. Uh, there are some days when I think I see a horse uh, on his or her toes and uh, somebody like myself who played on the famous Clydesdale line when I played for the Chicago Blackhawks, just for the record, we were the fastest Clydesdales in <laughs> NHL history. Um, 
but you know, and then the horse, you know, the horse doesn't run a lick. Um, I think I become better at seeing more negative vibes, John, than, than, than maybe seeing when maybe a horse is sitting on a big race. I don't know if that makes any sense, but, uh, I have seen and caught and I'm like, and that's what, I mean, I miss a lot about, uh, the horse, the racetrack. I miss a lot about going to the track, but I really do miss that opportunity to see a horse during the post parade, uh, after the post parade, how does a horse carry themselves? Are they refusing? Is the jockey really trying? So, I mean, I think all of those things uh, are part of, of handicapping, but also too, as far as look at, I'm, I'm a horse owner right now. Um, have a partnership in uh, a horse that happened to w- win the uh, temperance hill at Oak Lawn a couple of weeks ago, a mile and a half on the dirt with Carlos L and, and Mac Robertson. Um, so very proud of that and hoping that we can uh, be off to bigger and better things there. But, you know, look at, if you're looking to claim or buy, I mean, you see tendencies of horses and how they act and are, you know, are they good gate horses? Are they, so I think there's a lot there, but I, I've tried to become better at it. I'm still working at it. But I think I'm better at picking up horses that maybe show me, uh, you know, the, the body language isn't good here. So, and look, and if you happen to see a race, a horse doesn't have great body language, uh, and the horse is three to five, you know, I'd be willing as a handicapper to just throw that horse out. I wanted to ask about your overall handicapping approach because I, I watch you on the NBC broadcast, and I feel like you're kind of you're kind of restricted in in, in what you can bet and what you can explain to mm-hmm. the audience short amount of time. So I'm wondering in your regular life as a horse player, how your approach kind of differs compared to when you're on TV and you have to, for lack of a better word, dumb it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And Cliff notes version is pretty much what I, you know, what happens on television because I would love uh, our terrific producer uh, producers, I should say, Rob Hyland and Lindsay Shanzer at NBC uh, who pretty much run and Billy Matthews as well run our, uh, you know, run our shows and, you know, there's only so much time and yeah, I would love to, and I'm always pounding a table asking for another 30 seconds or whatever, but, um, you know, you try to just go, Hey, you know what, here's what I like, here's why. And then, you know, get off. I mean, I could probably go on as, as, as we all know, I mean, you know, you could really go in depth, but I think for me, the, the first thing I would say is, is I, I, I do look at, um, you know, the, the, the class of the race and then the class of the field. Um, I, I really have kind of become better at knowing the conditions, knowing the understanding of, you know, maybe w- what a, you know, you know, how does a, you know, a, a never win for a lifetime at park set up with a, you know, with an open 10 at aqueduct, you know, I mean, just something small like that, but to be able to just understand the conditions and how difficult maybe a race or a, may, a race may not be. Um, I, I, I do, I kind of do try to look at, um, you know, recent form, but I think where you really catch a lot of horses is if you can look past a, a bad line, a, a negative line, um, just like an old broken down hockey player, like myself, I didn't feel good in a lot of the games that I played in the NHL. I mean, I played over a thousand games in the league and I'm sure there were probably hundreds of games where, you know, I just didn't have it. Now it's a team game and sometimes you can blend in and, and find a way to get the job done. But in horse racing, you know, whether it's the jock or the equine athletes, uh, they can't tell us, I mean, the jock can, but the horse can't tell us if they're not feeling well or they have something sore. Um, but I, I, I really like to, to, to dig deep into the handicapping, uh, look at the racing form, um, to be able to look at videos, um, maybe 15 years ago, uh, those of us that really believe in the video aspect of handicapping probably had an edge. That's probably gone by the wayside now, especially with phones and, you know, the internet and being able to get races on a drop of a hat. So, you know, that's kind of equaled itself out. Um, but I, I'm, I'm old school. I'm, I'm, I, you know, the daily, daily racing forum gets a workout. My express bet account gets a workout. Um, but I, but I like to, to try to dig deep into races. And sometimes if, if I like a horse, I, I don't, honestly, I don't look at the odds. I don't, if I like a horse and I see the race and, and I come up with it and I see the horse is 30 to one and, and it's not going to sway me. And I think that's the one thing that I try to teach handicappers is that the horse doesn't know his odds. If you like the horse, you got to have some conviction and you got to be willing to stand up and draw a line in the sand and say, look at 
I don't care what the odds are is that I just feel that this horse is going to run, you know, run to that. And, and, and one last thing I will say is you have to take what the track gives you. You have to take what the public gives you. If you like a horse on that aspect of it, and he's 30 to one, feel free. If a horse is even money or seven to five or nine to five, you know, sometimes you gotta, you know, what's wrong with turning a, you know, a, a nice, uh, you know, 75 or 80% profit. If, if you're betting other things that you don't hit it, uh, there's nothing wrong with betting a nine to five. So I think having conviction, looking at the class of the race and, uh, and really doing your homework and not only visually, but, uh, uh, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the gut feeling on, on trying to pick a winner, or if you're playing pick threes, pick fives or pick sixes. Hey, Eddie, bear with me for a minute as I'm going to take you away from the racetrack for just a second. Uh, you came out with a book a couple months ago with a good friend of mine, Perry Lefko, that you worked together on called Beating the Odds in Hockey and in Life. Highly recommended. It's a terrific book. I think everybody uh, who has interested in hockey, horse racing, or just human stories should go to Amazon, et cetera, and, and look for that book. But um, this is probably a question you might need an hour to answer, but I'll ask you to get <laughs> A little bit shorter answer. You had colon cancer. You had to stare at yourself in the mirror and, and wonder at the end of the day, if I'm going to beat this thing or not, how does something like that change a person? Wow. Well, there is a lot there, Bill. So guys, so put your feet up and just give me a chance <laughs> to, uh, to, to, uh, to stick handle my way through here. Um, you know, look at, I, I was on the verge of turning 51 years of age, uh, relatively healthy. Um, no cancer in the family of Eddie Olchek at all. And one day I woke up and I couldn't go to the bathroom. I couldn't go number two. And that was not normal for me. Uh, I didn't say anything. Uh, typical ex-hockey player and horse player. I went to the Walgreens. I brought some, uh, I bought some prune juice and some, you know, some Metamucil to try to break up my stomach so I could go to the bathroom and uh, nothing happened. And all of a sudden now it's two days later and I'm starting to become very uncomfortable. Fast forward a little bit. I got rushed to the hospital. Um, they told me I had a blockage in my colon. And look, at this this was all foreign language to me. I mean, blockage in my colon. I'm like, what's going on? And sure enough, they said, you know, we need to go in there and clean you out. And we need to find out what the blockage is. So now when you start getting into it, you're like, okay, this is pretty serious. And I had a six and a half hour surgery that removed a tumor the size of my fist. Um, and they told me they would send it out and they would let me know what the result was. And on August the 4th, at 7.07 PM of 2017, uh, I got a call from Dr. Scott Strong, who was a surgeon that removed the tumor. And he told me that uh, at any time you get a call from a doctor at seven o'clock at night, that's probably not a good call. And I knew what was on the other line. And he told me that uh, your tumor came back and uh, you've been diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. And uh, we're recommending six months of chemotherapy and we would reassess from there. Um, the first thing I thought was, well, how long do I have to live? Because anytime I thought about cancer uh, or heard about cancer and it all, unfortunately, it touches us all. It doesn't discriminate, by the way. Um, I thought, how long do I have to live? And that's what I thought of cancer and death. That's all I, I knew. Uh, colon cancer is very treatable if you can get to it early. Um, but I was at stage three and I was in one of those situations that it could have gone either way. So I was very lucky to have an incredible team of doctors. Uh, my wife, Diana, will be married almost, uh, well, we will be married 33 years come, uh, come August. And my wife was there every step of the way, Bill. She, um, I never saw her weak. I never saw her down. I never saw her worried. Um, but I know that when I wasn't around or she was by herself, I know that she let her guard down and caretakers and caregivers are so important. And we have to make sure that we're looking after them as well. And I started my six months of chemo on September 11th of 2017. And it was every two weeks for 48 hours. I would go to Northwestern Hospital here in Chicago and they would give me uh, four hours of chemo. And then they would hook me up with a fanny pack. I had a port in my chest and they would hook it up and I would have this drip every 90 seconds for, for two days um, that uh, I had to deal with. And then they would come and unhook me uh, on Wednesday mornings. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, I had enough quiet time to last me a lifetime uh, when I was in that battle and I would hear that pump go off every 90 seconds. And uh 
you know, I, even though I was scared and, and the side effects brought me to my knees, uh, my second treatment, um, I had neuropathy set in in my fingers and my toes. Uh, I had terrible nosebleeds. I developed, developed a blood clot. I had bad headaches. And, and uh, this is when I hit my low. Uh, I just... I just went to the bathroom. I just went number two without controlling it. And I was ready to quit. And I had never quit at anything in my life. I'm sitting there going, how in the hell am I going to get through today, let alone get through another five months of, of chemo and not know what's on the other end of it? And I was ready to quit. And I had never quit at anything in my life. It came to playing hockey, coaching hockey, being at the racetrack. I mean, if I was down... 200 bucks at the track. I was, I wasn't quitting. All right. Scratch that. If I was down 2000, <laughs> I, I wasn't quitting. I, I was going to find a way to get back and battle back. And, but I was ready to quit. It brought me to my knees. It, it, uh, it tests my will to live. And my wife, uh, Diana, um, she gave me the greatest inspirational speech I ever got in any locker room, any, any setting in my life, because I just said, I can't live like this. I, I can't. And not only being scared and worried, I'm just like, this, this is not right. And she grabbed me and she just pretty much said, Hey, look at, you got to fight. You got to fight for me. You got to fight for our four kids and you got to fight for all the people that love you. And that conversation lasted for 30 minutes and I cried for 35 of it. And I said, okay, I'm just going to grab my hockey helmet and put it back on and I'm going to go day to day and I'm going to fight and I'm going to set goals for myself. And, you know, whether it was getting back and doing games or, you know, um, talking to people that were in a battle similar to Eddie Olchek or get ready for the Breeders Cup, um, you know, get ready for my daughter's graduation at the end of December of 17 uh, down at the University of Alabama, where she was a senior roll tide. Um I just, I went day to day. And the one thing that I will say in, in having um, communicated with so many people being touched by this horrible disease is, you know, you asked me, Bill, about the aspect of, you know, you know, you know, how, you know, has it changed me after going through this? And, and, and quite honestly, you know, long winded uh, to answer the heart of your question, um, I really don't think it has changed me. Uh, the one thing I will say is that when I was in my battle, when I was going through the most difficult time of my life, um, I was very much at peace when I was going through this. And, and let me explain that. Even though I was scared and I didn't want to die um, and I was worried and, 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 the, and the chemo was bringing me to my knees and not knowing what was on the other end, I've always lived my life and I don't know where I learned this, but I'm very thankful that I did, is I've always let the most important people in my life, we all have a circle, right? We all have a, a, a tight circle. And I've always let those people know how much they've meant to me. I've always told them, you know, like, my life has been complete with you in my life. I want you to know that God forbid something would happen. And most of my inner circle would always tell me, ah, it's so quiet, you know, I mean, nothing's going to happen. Don't talk like that. And, you know, and again, you know, but I, I just, I wanted somebody to know, because look at in the world that we live in and, you know, it's human nature. We all think we're invincible and we're all going to be around for hundreds of years. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that we're all day to day in the big picture. But I think what helped me get through my most difficult time was, is that I was very much at peace because the most important people in my life knew how I felt about them and knew that my life was way better with them in it. And if it was my time, I could close my eyes and be rest assured that my family and the most important people in my life knew how I felt about them. And when you are by yourself and you're fighting this battle, and I was never by myself, but when I was by myself, because I lived in our basement for about 18 hours a day for six months, um, I was socially distancing four years ago before that became the thing to do now. Um, it would, no pun intended, it would kill me that if I was not here, 
that the most important people in my life didn't know how I felt about them. And that really helped me get through my most difficult time. And sadly, guys, whether it's in hockey or horse racing and in whatever, you know, public status that I have in my story, I hope can help. And, 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 and you mentioned Bill writing the book with, with Perry Lefko, who I've known since I was a 20 year old hockey player with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, if my goal was to help, if I could help one person either stay away from it, help them deal with it, or just help them fight through it, then it was well worth the 16 months of pen to paper. I did the book with Perry and, um, you know, I know there's a lot there, but if, if I can make a difference and I appreciate you guys letting me tell that story because I know there's somebody out there and it doesn't have to be cancer. It could be anything. And think about the battles that we're all in now, the, the you know, the obstacles that we're living through, through COVID-19 and, um, you know, we still have to live. We still have to take care of ourselves mentally. We still have to make sure we're going to the doctor. And, and uh, the one last thing I will say, because March is colorectal cancer awareness month. Um, as I said, when I got diagnosed, the recommended age for a colonoscopy was 50. And we're almost to the four year uh, milestone for myself anyways. Um, since then, it, the age has been lowered. It is recommended that we all now, men and women, every race, every denomination, it doesn't matter, is that you get a colonoscopy at the age of 45. Now, if you have family history, as my children, my four children do, um, they will be uh, re yeah, not, not required. Uh, I will tell them they need to have a colonoscopy when they're 40, so 10 years prior. Um, so the number is, is has come down. And the scary thing is, is that uh, colon, colon cancer in specifically is, is up almost 30% in, uh, in ages between 18 and 50 over the course of the last 10 years. So we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And one last, last thing is please, if you're not feeling good, if you know of somebody that needs to be looked after, uh, please ask for help. Please raise your hand. It's okay to say, Hey, I don't feel good. Or it's that time that I need to have a, a checkup because if we can help one person out there, stay away from it. Uh, look at, I would trade in anything, uh, to have bypassed the six months of hell that I live with the chemotherapy. If I would have found that tumor a little bit earlier, but look at, I, I was just doing what they told me. I, I was 50 years of age and I was on my way in for a colonoscopy and, Unfortunately, getting constipated, uh, you know, I, I beat the doctors to the punch and had a tumor growing there, they said, for probably 10 years. And uh, and hopefully we can make a difference with somebody out there. So make sure you're looking after yourself and uh, and uh, seeing your uh, your physician and and uh, and requesting uh, the proper care that, that that we all should get, regardless if you're feeling good or not, because a lot of colon cancer patients, uh, the people that get diagnosed with it, they feel perfectly fine. They just don't know that they have something growing inside them. That's, a, that's an incredible inspirational story. And then we appreciate you sharing it with us. I remember when, when it was first announced that, that you had cancer and the reaction just from the, your buddies on NBC and like you could tell how much they loved you and cared about you. And just for someone who had never met you or, you know, talked to you before, I, I felt it. I felt it. I felt it because you were part of my life as a hockey fan. And as a Ranger fan specifically, so we appreciate you, you you telling the story. I have two more questions before we let you get out of here. One is a hockey question that may or may not end up in the cutting room floor. Um, <laughs> first one is I know you're, do, you're doing a, a partnership with First Bet and Express yeah. Bet. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that entails? Yeah, well, first off, look, at I've, I've been a client, uh, proud to say, since 1996 with uh, with Express Bet and now Blossom into, into First Bet. And, uh, you know, look at the world we're living in now, uh, you know, you can get on your phone or your iPad and and download the first uh, the first bet app or, you know, me being old school with Express Bet. And they've been the uh, the, the chosen one, so to speak, and the uh, the favorite uh, ADW for horse racing and myself. And we've got a lot of exciting things going on with the new app and and handicapping tools galore. I mean, as you guys know, I mean, there's so many ways to handicap and with the, uh, the technology that we have. And then I know in the NHL and in sports in general, analytics become a huge part of sports. Uh, I think we've seen this here, uh, you know, over the last handful of years in different forms, whether it's the sheets or, or uh, you know, apps that are being developed or software to help give you an edge. And uh, the people at ExpressBed have been a part of my family for a long, long time. And uh, 
Uh, I know my express bet account's going to get a workout here over the course of the next 30 days and into the first Saturday in May, Joe. So uh, I'm very proud to be a part of their family. I do a lot of work with them as far as handicapping. Hopefully people have made a little bit of Monday. We did tout known agenda the other day, as I mentioned a little bit earlier to Bill about, you know, kind of the horses that I'd like. So a nice square price there at, I think, just short of six to one, which was pretty amazing. But uh, yeah, the people at, uh, at first bet and express bet, uh, They've been terrific. The Stronic family I've known for a long, long time and uh, very proud to be a part of their family. And hopefully people will uh, will take the first bet app and uh, hopefully we can pick a few winners for them as well. Cool. So look forward to that. The other question is a specific Rangers question. You're a guy who won the Stanley <laughs> Cup with the Rangers in 94. I see a lot of people wanting to fire David Quinn. Do you think he's going to make it until until they finally blossom into the team that we all think they're going to be? Do you think he's going to make it or is he going to get fired? Uh, well, okay. There's a lot there. So let, let's just go baby steps. First off, first off look at what kind yeah, of hat I got. Baby. Let's go. Right That's on. What I'm about. Look at that. Huh? You like that, That's Joe? What I'm talking what? about right there. There, Stanley Cup champions. Look at, I can't believe we had our, our 25 year, re, 25, easy for me to say, 25 year reunion two years ago. Uh, the Rangers brought everybody in, um, it was just, uh, it was just awesome. I mean, to see all the guys and to, to, to have been a part of a team that brought a championship to New York and the first one for the Rangers since 1940. So 54 years, but look at you're talking to a Cubs fan Cubs hadn't won a world series in 108 years. So, I mean, look at twice as long and haven't been around that long, but being 54, um, you know, it took me a while to see my Cubs finally win a world series a couple of years ago. Um, as far as the Rangers, look, I, I will say this. Uh, they got incredible leadership uh, with John Davidson running the Rangers now. Jeff Gorton, I think the jump manager, has done an amazing job of stockpiling because when he came in, there wasn't much in the in the cupboard. I mean, they, they didn't have a lot of draft picks, and he's done an amazing job there. And this is a very competitive team, still probably short a center Iceman, in my opinion. But I think they're on the verge of doing some really good things moving forward. As far as David Quinn, um, this guy knows what he's doing. He's a very good coach. Uh, I think Ranger fans need to be patient. Uh, you know, they want. That's not what we do. That's not yeah. what we do. I know. I know. I lived there. I lived there for three years. I still hear it whenever I go into New York and I get a lot of these same questions. Now, I haven't been in New York in a while, but I think you know what I'm talking about prior. Um, I know they want Lafreniere to be the next Sidney Crosby or Patrick Kane. I know they want Taco to be the next power forward like Adam Graves or whoever, but you know, look at, I, I think he's handled those young guys extremely well. Look at, you're not going to agree with everything that the coach does. I understand it. I lived it. I lived, I, I was a coach in Pittsburgh for almost three years. So I understand that. But David Quinn knows what he's doing. I think in time, the Rangers will take that next step because I think he's going to have good tools to work with. But look, at the end of the day, you know, coach has got to find a way to, 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 to make sure that his players and his team are improving. It's an exciting team to watch. Uh, and that's how player coaches are judged, especially with young teams, Joe, like they, you, your young players have to improve. So, um, I know there's a lot there to unravel, but I, I like David Quinn. He's he, I mean, like, I've known him for a long time. Um, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I think he's doing, a, I think he's doing a really good job. And I think in time, the Rangers are on the, they're on the cusp. They really are. And again, I think they need another center Iceman. Maybe if they can prove their back end a little bit, but you know, Hey, maybe it's not this year. Uh, they got some chips on the roster to maybe move to maybe bring in some of those guys. But for me, I like the direction the Rangers are going and uh, we'll see how that all plays out over the course of the next couple of years. Appreciate that. I'm actually in the minority. I don't think that they should fire Quinn. A lot of the Ranger fans do. The team is developing and they, people say they're inconsistent. They're the yeah. youngest team in the NHL. They're going to be inconsistent. That's just how it works. So appreciate the time. That's going to end up on the cutting room floor, like I said. So I appreciate you just doing that <laughs> me personally. I will record it and keep it for myself. Um, so, Eddie Olchek, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. And best of luck the rest of the hockey season and in derby season. We'll be watching. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It was a real pre pleasure to be with you guys. I'm big. I'm a big fan. And uh, keep up the great work. And I uh, look forward for our, uh, our paths to uh, cross in person uh, instead of this virtual uh, world we're all living in. So best of luck at the track and stay safe. And uh, I look forward to chatting with you guys uh, sooner than later. So thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Absolutely, Eddie. man. Same here. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. 
As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Eddie Olchek, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from the Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Okay, so this is a monster, monster weekend of racing coming up. This is honestly, I think, the most underreported blockbuster day of the year. Obviously, we all know about Derby Day and Breeders' Cup Day and Travers Day, but the the big prep day for the Oaks and Derby has so many great stakes on it. Um, big cars at Aqueduct, Keeneland, and Santa Anita. I just want to run through the, the, the stakes we have real quick. Uh, Aqueduct has got the Bay Shore for three-year-olds, the Carter, which is a grade one, the Excelsior, the Gazelle for three-year-old Phillies, the Wood Memorial for three-year-old Colts. Uh, Keeneland has the Appalachian, the Central Bank Ashland, the Commonwealth, the uh, Madison, the Shaker Town, the Toyota Bluegrass. Even Oakland has the Fantasy for three-year-old Phillies, which, which might get a couple of, of nice horses. And then at Santa Anita, we have the uh, Santa Anita Derby card, which features obviously the Run Happy Santa Anita Derby, the Santa Anita Oaks, the Royal Heroine, and the Providencia. Uh, don't want to forget that Friday has some decent racing as well, which is opening day at Keeneland. We're all looking forward to that. Aqueduct has the Distaff Handicap, but Keeneland has the Beaumont and the Transylvania, as well as the Palisades Turf Sprint. So three stakes on Friday for Keeneland to lead into their huge, huge uh, Saturday card. Just a couple quick observations uh, from what we probably will be looking at. The, in the Appalachian is an interesting matchup between Plum Ali, who's back, um, will make her three-year-old uh, debut after being one of the top uh, juvenile turf fillies in America last year. Uh, she's going to face off against Jouster, who we talked to Jack Wolf about. She's a very, very nice horse, but probably doesn't want to go a step beyond a mile. She's going to get a mile in there. Also, uh, Spanish Love Affair, who got, I thought, unjustly DQ'd, and here comes the bride, is going to be in that in that race as well. Uh, John's going to have some action along with the friends at West Point Thoroughbreds in the Shaker Town with Turned Aside, a son of American Pharaoh, um, in that race. And then we want to, well, we're mostly going to focus on the three-year-olds. We'll talk about everything that happens that that's noteworthy. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, but just wanted to, to pull up the, uh, the probables for the three-year-old races this week. Uh, and the Santa Anita Derby is going to be a lot of action in terms of our contest. Uh, we have Roman Centurion for Brian, who's currently leading. Um, we have the great one for me, Dream Shake for me. And I believe uh, Medina Spirit for Bill. Um, is, is going to have some action in that race. Um, the Keeneland card is actually drawn already. The Keeneland Saturday card is a big field um, in the in the bluegrass, which is obviously headed by one essential quality, who we're all we're all excited to see still undefeated um, in that race. But I think there's going to be some other action as well for our contest. Hidden stash for Brian is going to be in there, highly motivated for John. Um, keep me in mind. I think that's another Bill horse, and then Ron Bauer, who Brian also has. So. Lots of action in there. Uh, in the Wood Memorial, prevalence is going to be the big story to see whether he's he can he can live up to the hype. This is his own. This is his chance to get into the Derby. So I think I think Brennan Walsh can live and die with whatever happens in that race. So uh, prevalence is in there for Bill, um, and then also we have risk taking. I think Al picked picked risk taking, um, and then is there one other horse in there? John, help me out here. I in thought the there was a third one. In the Santa Anita no. race, it's uh, Roman Aqueduct. Centurion, which is Brian's. Aqueduct. Aqueduct. Oh, I'm sorry. The Wood? Yeah. The, the Wood, you have Risk Taking, which is Al's. Candyman Rocket, which is with Bill. Um, Prevalence, which is also with Bill. And that's uh, that's it, as far as I can I can see. Yep. Uh, yeah, all right. Great that. I was I was missing Candyman Rocket. So if we can throw out the standings real quick, uh, I am bringing up the rear this year. Uh, Brian has done very well with his – Stable so far. Still a lot of time left, a lot to be decided. And I think this weekend is going to, and then this weekend and next is going to, you know, set the, set the final picture for the Derby and what, what we can likely expect. It's definitely more wide open, at least on the betting board without life is good. So that just means any of us still have a shot, even me, even little old me with 17 points. All right. So we're, we're looking forward to all that. Uh, 
Keeneland especially, we're very, very much looking forward. Keeneland's going to have limited fans at this meet, and so we're, we're excited about that. One of the most beautiful meets in the country, and I'm not just saying that because they're a sponsor. I really do. I really am looking forward to, to betting Keeneland this meet. Okay, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland Horses of Racing Age sale in April is April 26th. You can enter up until April 5th. The Keeneland Spring Meet kicks off this Friday with three stakes leading into their bluegrass card on Saturday. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Eddie Olchek, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Danny Seiper, Aliyah LaRocca, and Anthony LaRocca. Thank you so much for watching. Please wear a mask and get vaccinated if you can. Enjoy the big weekend of racing. We'll see you next week. Thank you.